Hello, and welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and today I will be delving into the next chapter of Terry Eagleton, which is on post-structuralism, and it's chapter four in his book. And before I go into the chapter, I must uh, let you know that this is only going to be part one, and I will probably record a second lecture on the same chapter after this. So today I'll be covering the beginning part of the chapter itself. Now, keep in mind that in the beginning of this chapter, Eagleton kind of explains for us our understanding of structuralism, which he discusses in the previous chapter, and certain claims associated with Saussurean linguistics, and then builds his argument by offering us one of the most potent critiques of that kind of structuralist linguistics, and which is by Jacques Derrida. So the pages that I'll be talking about today pretty much are all, and he admits it, drawn from Derrida's working on the structuralist assumptions about the text and textuality. And then, as I've mentioned in some of my other lectures too, post-structuralism is not one monolithic movement. It has different schools within it. But in today's part, I'll primarily be discussing Eagleton's take on Jörg Derrida and his work and his assumptions about texts and how to read them. Uh, so on the very first page, page 110, Eagleton starts with a challenge to the Saussurean linguistics. And I quote on page 110, he say, the question he's posing is, what has become of Saussure's idea that language forms a closed, stable system? Now, if you remember my previous lecture, what Saussure had asserted was that the sign itself is arbitrary. The relationship between the signifier and the signified is arbitrary. But once it's accepted within the long, within the system of a language, then it becomes fixed, right? And so that's why he's also saying that Sashore's long suggests a delimited structure of meaning. But where in the language do you draw a line? How do you know that this sign has become stable, right? and that we don't need to look any further, right? And on the same page, he, what he's talking about is that in language also mostly there is an endless play of signifiers. How? Okay, so if you look up a word, right, all you get, so you're looking up a word which is constituted of a signifier and signified. What you get is another word, right, which in itself is a signifier. Right, But if I'm looking the meaning of the word to eat, right, and I get another meaning for it, right, then that meaning, even though it's an individual sign, has now become a signified for to eat, right, because I'm looking for the meaning. So when I look for meanings, all I get is more signs, right? And they all, in a way, inform each other. So that is what he means by an endless play of signifiers, one signifier trying to explain another signifier, and signifiers themselves becoming signified, and vice versa. And then there is a great insight on page 111 where he's talking about slippage between the signifier and the signified. How does that slippage happen? Right now, if there is, right, all we can do is look for meaning, let's say, in a dictionary or in a thesaurus, right? And if the world that I'm looking up becomes the signifier and the meaning that are offered to us are signified, so there is no way the meaning can 100% correspond with this signifier, right? And hence, in that process, there can be a lot of slippage. The meaning is not fixed on that sense, right? 
And then the most important insight on page 111, remember in Sosur we had learned that signs also mean something in difference from other signs, right? So what that insight taught us was that meaning is differential. Meaning is one sign meaning something in difference from another sign. Cat is a cat because it's not a hat, right? Dog is a dog because it's not a pony. Meaning is differential. So that means that meaning is not substantial to the sign. Sign itself does not carry its own meanings. We know its meanings because it's not another sign. So meaning is then outside of a sign. That's what he means by meaning is differential and not substantial. Now, if that is one of the stronger assumptions of Sashurian linguistics, that meaning is through differences, then we already are in perilous territory because what that means is that for any sign to announce its meanings or to claim its meanings, it must point us to another sign because it can only mean something in difference from another sign. And so the ultimate question then becomes is, uh, if the meaning is not in the sign itself and is outside of it, then where does it exist? right? That's where difference becomes important, right? Not just in language itself, but in our own ideas of self, right? But keep that in mind. We'll move forward. So then he's briefly touching upon meaning depending on difference of one sign from another, right? But also pointing to another wonderful Deridian insight. Now, in Sushur, we learned that when signs are placed side by side in a semiological chain, right, they, they mean something in difference from each other, right? And so meaning, therefore, is always, always through that difference. Now, Derridian term for that is difference, right? What, he, what Derrida then teaches us is that reading a semiological chain is a temporal process. We read something over time. In the process of doing that, we are reading and understanding something through difference of one sign from another, but meaning is also always deferred to the next sign, right? So when I move from one sign to the next, I carry a trace of the sign with me to the next sign, and that is how I know what that sign means. So for example, I always use this slightly confusing example in my classes. This is a cat, right? It is a sentence. Now, when I read this is a cat, the this in this is a cat is the this in this is a cat because I am already defer deferring its meaning to the is. Right? When I get to the is, I already carry a trace of this in it. So the this is a cat. The is in this is a cat already has the this in it, a trace of it. If that trace is not there, I would not know what that is means, right? But when I reach this is, the is itself is pointing me to the next sign. The meaning is held in abeyance. It's in, it's deferred to the next sign, ah, right? So this is ah, the ah in this is a cat, is the ah in this is a cat, because this and is is in it. And it's also pointing, pointing the ultimate meaning to the, to the next sign, cat. So the cat in this is a cat, is the cat in this is a cat, because this is a, the traces of them are in it, and then it reverses back. So that is the concept of difference, right? People would give you like really erudite explanations of it, but that's literally what it means. Next, we move to the discussion of the differential nature of the sign on page 112. Eagleton then poses another question. If a sign is what it is not, then where is the meaning? Isn't that an important question? 
right? And it's a huge question. Because if meaning is through difference from other signs and there is no substantial meaning of the sign itself, and we've already learned that when we look up a sign, all we get is other signs, right? So if the meaning is not in the sign itself and is constituted through difference, right? Then the meaning is outside of the sign, right? So somehow what is not part of the sign itself is actually more crucial to the construction of the meaning of the sign itself. If we apply it to ourselves, our real life situations, then me, myself, am me, myself, because of my difference from others. So my others then constitute me and not me myself. It completely changes our idea of who we are and this self-constituting human subject because we realize that in order to constitute ourselves as a sign, as Masood Raja, I need something outside of me to construct myself. That is where deconstruction becomes this ethical practice, right? Because the other is not this extreme alterity out there, the other is absolutely necessary to constitute a self, right? That's why Spivak speaks about Derrida in that way. Then we've already discovered it. A sign has the traces of the signs that it has excluded to be itself, right? Now, that is where we are coming to the binary structure of language in so sure, right? Because a sign, how does it constitute itself? How does it stabilize itself? Through exclusions, right? It must constantly guard against the attack on it on two fronts. And I'll come to that in a minute. So it must constantly exclude or hold at bay the meaning that is infusing itself in it through differences in a, on a linear plane, right? but also on a horizontal plane, because as I am saying these words, there are all these other words arraying there, fighting for, right? So a sign has the traces of the sign that, is, that it has excluded to be itself, right? It can exclude that, but it cannot mean anything without those traces, right? This is a cat, the is is a sign, but it is the is because it's excluding the signs that adjacent to it, but it cannot mean the is in the sentence if the traces of those signs are not in it. So what we learned then, according to Eagleton, is that language is much less stable than classical structuralists had believed, right? That the, the fight is not over after a community within long has decided that this is what we mean when we say this, because even within that agreement, when the sign gets fixed, there can be slippages and the slippage is on two axes, right? And that's very important for us to understand. So it's on the paradigmatic axis, right? And syntagmatic axis. So the semiological chain, the man cried, is, is the chain, what we would call it is, is, is syntagmatic axis. The paradigmatic axis is, ex, axis is where all the other signs are competing for that intention and can, can at any time replace or send their trace into the semiological chain. So when we say the sign has become unstable, it has become unstable on these two axes, right? And this is an important insight to keep in mind. So I hope, you know, by now, I hope you're not totally confused and I haven't lost you. And with this discussion, he's increasingly then moving into Derrida, right? So on page 112, he starts discussing the question of presence. And the question of presence is one of the major questions in Derrida's first book, right, of grammatology. And I'll get to it in a minute. But let me read this out. What is he saying? So for such theories, the theories that he has described before this paragraph in the book are the theories that believed in this idea of a centered self where we inwardly made meanings of the things, understood them. Remember the super reader of the structuralist who could read the structure of a text, right? All of them assumed that kind of a reading. But for such theories, he says, it was the function of science to reflect inward experiences or objects in the real world, right? Me being able to name things, 
to make present one's thoughts and feelings or to describe how reality was. The whole idea of representation, my ability to explain the world to you or to unravel is, is it, it lies within that belief that when I am present and I say something to you, somehow the chances of you misconstruing me are less because I am present there. And the presence of the meaning within the sign is the same idea, that the sign when, when said or spoken carries its own meanings, right? But what we now realize that is that this idea that meaning is present in the signs is an illusion. We already know that meaning is differential, right? A sign means something because it is not something else. So. It is an illusion for me to believe that I can ever be fully present to you in what I say or write. Because to use signs at all entails that my meaning is always somehow dispersed, divided, and never quite at one with itself. And the reason they are not never quite one with itself is because of the slippage in the process of signification itself, but on those two axes that I talked about, and also because signs mean something because of their difference from other signs. Not only my meaning indeed, but me, since language is something I'm made out of, rather than merely, merely a convenient tool I use, the whole idea that I am a stable entity must also be a fiction. How do we maintain that fiction right through erasure through maintaining a binary structure of me and him. But even that structure is maintained through differences, right? But the problem of presence in Derrida is this privileging of presence, you know, because in his book of grammatology, he is saying well, in the Western culture has traditionally been um, logocentric and that is what he calls a metaphysics and logocentric in a sense that speech has always been privileged over writing. Now, remember that whole discussion uh, of why is speech privileged over writing? Because speech is one removed from the ideal form. So the idea coming from Plato that, so when I'm speaking, I'm drawing the signs from an ideal form and expressing them. So it's just that one remove, whereas writing was a copy of a copy. But in of grammatology, Derrida basically says that the structure of speech is actually inscription because we are inscribing something. And if that is that, then writing is actually, it comes before speech, right? So, so the Western logocentricism so phono, and I'll quote here, just as Western philosophy has been phonocentric, phonocentric meaning privileging speech, centered on the living voice and deeply suspicious of script. So also it has been logocentric, committed to a belief in some ultimate word, presence, essence, truth or reality, which will act as the foundation of all our thoughts. So what is this logocentricism, right? There are two ends to it, right? Transcendental signifier, right? And the transcendental signified. So the transcendental signifier in this sense is something outside of language that can control meanings for us. The concept of God, a scripture, a holy book, right? And the transcendental signified then is the other end of speech or writing where we reach the end of meaning, right? right? But suddenly we realize post Sashorian linguistics and post structuralism that there is no transcendental signifier, right? Because all we have is signs upon signs upon signs and there is no transcendental signified. We never reach the end of meanings. Our understanding is usually at best provisional because all we get is a sign for another sign, meaning through difference, right? Then, I'm going to the next slide, sorry. Then he explains, Eagleton starts explaining to us one of the major schools of post-structuralism, which is deconstruction. 
Okay, and he gives us certain claims which come from Derrida. On page 114, we get there is no concept which is not embroiled in an open ended play of signification, shot through with the traces and fragments of other ideas. We already talked about it. You know, a sign is always contingent on one, on two axes, right? On the paradigmatic axis and uh, the syntagmatic axis. Sign is also. Um, unstable because it doesn't carry its own meanings. It relies on something outside of it to construe itself, to make meanings. So given that in mind, in very simple terms, the way Eagleton describes deconstruction is deconstruction is the name giving to the critical operation by which such binary oppositions. Now remember, Saussurian linguistic also worked on these binary oppositions, right? Uh, since uh, a sign means something through a difference, most of the times that is expressed in a binary structure, man, woman, you know, white, black, civilized, uncivilized, right? This binary structure. Now, what deconstruction does is, it's the name given to the critical operation by which such binary oppositions can be partly undermined or by which they can be shown partly to undermine each other in the process of textual meaning. Now, furthermore, deconstruction has grasped the point that the binary oppositions with which structuralism tends to work represent a way of seeing typical of ideologies. Ideologies draw rigid boundaries between what is acceptable and what is not. So. In a way, then, one form of post-structuralism is deconstruction, right? And deconstruction is when you pick up an established binary structure, man, woman, which is hierarchically maintained and almost thought fixed, right? And then work on it in a way where you're not saying this is superior or this is not, where, where what you do is, you weaken the hard line between the binary, where you can either prove that part of man is also woman and part of woman is also man and disrupt that binary structure, right? And if you have done that within the larger structure of culture, then you have opened a space, a political space actually, for more possibilities for one end of the binary. Another thing that happens in the binary structure is that one end of the binary is always privileged, right? Socially and politically. So if you disrupt that binary of gender, of class, of region, north and south, of color, of civilized and all. So what you are then doing is you, you are maybe making the sign more democratic, but actually impacting the world itself. Think of it, so much of what we have accomplished, at least here in America, is based in disrupting the binary structure. The rights of gays and lesbians and transgender people absolutely depended on, on, on eliminating the hard binary of male, female, right? Um, racial binary structures, white, black, brown, whatever you wanna call it right? That binary structure needed to be disrupted for people like me and others to claim that we are equally as human and equally as civilized as anyone else and hence should also have the same rights as, uh, as our counterparts. All of that was maintained through a binary structure in the culture, right? The hierarchies are maintained through the binary structure. Right? For example, uh, this month, uh, you know, women all over the world on March 8th marched in the streets, right, to be acknowledged as equal to their male counterparts, right? And if you look at the response in the Orat March or Women March in Pakistan coming from the conservative circles, absolutely wants to maintain the binary structure, maybe divinely ordained or whatever their claims are, because these people, mostly men, are frightened at the prospect of that binary structure being destabilized. So politics, even on the streets then, are doing that kind of deconstructive work, claiming the public sphere for women. But in the process, the first thing that must be done is destabilization of the inherently stable binary structure, right? So 
How does Derrida do it? Derrida's own typical habit of, and I'm quoting, of reading is to seize on some apparent, apparently peripheral fragment in the work, a footnote, a recurrent minor term or image, a casual allusion, and work it tenaciously through to the point where it threatens to dismantle the opposition, oppositions which govern the text as a whole, right? The tactic of deconstructive criticism, that is, is to show how texts come to embarrass their own ruling system of logic. And deconstruction shows this by fastening on the symptomatic points, the aporia or impasses of meaning. You know, I looked up emporia for you, so uh, you can look it up here. It's available, you know, on Wikipedia. But, or impasses of meaning, where texts gets into trouble, come unstruck, offer to contradict themselves. Okay, so let me unpack it. You know, um, I have a couple of more slides maybe. I think this is the last slide, so I'm gonna go to the full screen now and see um, if you can see me better. So let's go back to that claim. Now what deconstruction does according to Eagleton, what Derrida does is first of all, takes up a text and sees what, what its logical claim is. What is a text claiming to be? Then he will find something in the text. The idea is if the text is offering itself as a logical whole, right? Then how do you dismantle it? You can't, and this is this comes from Derrida's Plato's pharmacy, where he says is the purpose is not to embroider onto the fabric, but to find its weave, the histos of it, and, and unravel it. So what does he mean by that? What does he mean? What he means by that is the deconstruction in opposition to what you, me, and everyone else does, right? embroiders upon the text, here is upon that I'm going to read, here are two theoretical tools, I'm going to pick up these two theoretical tools and then write meanings onto this text with that insight. What he's saying is, no, 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 no. The way of doing it is to work with the text, but with the weave of the text. Now, in order to work with the weave of the text, you have to consume the whole text, right? Only then you can understand what is it claiming to be, right? And then find that one place, Derrida calls it the navel of the text, right? Find that one place where the text exceeds its own logic, where it cannot sustain itself and run it through the text, right? And if you do that, you have unraveled the very fabric, the very truth claims of a text, right? In Plato's pharmacy, he does that by using the term pharmacon, right? And he, he first of all picks up one of the neglected um, te uh, dialogues of Plato. And he starts with, for 2000 years, this has been sitting here. No one has considered it important. Some people thought it was Plato's later work. He was too old. Some people thought he was too young. But here, let me read this peripheral dialogue, Phaedrus, to make a point, right? Then here is a mention of pharmacia, right? No one paid attention to it. Why is it there? Why is it that this is the only dialogue, that, the only dialogue in Plato in which Socrates comes out of the city? What has brought him in, out, out of the city? Pharmacon, right? A speech that Phaedrus is carrying, which he wants Socrates to read. So by running the concept of pharmacon through the entire essay, Derrida isn't just proving that writing is before speech. What he's also saying is, here is the method, right? You pick up something that has been considered completely unimportant or peripheral to a text, and you first of all point out that this is quite significant and that if we tease it out, then we can undo the structure of meaning built around the text, right? I always use like uh, carefully though, but an example like from the third 
uh, from the Gospel of John, right? Where he says, you know, and God sent his only begotten son to his people. People just gloss over it, right? If you wanted to deconstruct it, you could basically say, can there be a God, first of all, who has his own people? Aren't all the people God's people? But let's just assume that we want to say, OK, can there be a God that has his own people that, that presupposes that there are certain people that are not his own people? And then if he sent Jesus to his own people, right? if he came to his own people, it already presupposes that he had predecided that some people are not his own people. So there goes the claims of universality of Jesus's message and the entire Catholic, right? You're not bringing something outside. You're not saying here is a new gospel. We are fine. You are working with the text itself against its universal claim that it is a universal text and then saying these ideas are irreconcilable, right? Just as when I argue with my Muslim friends, right, lovingly, when they point to me about women not being equal and all, and they point me to the Quranic verses, I, I say, fine, OK. Um, do you think that if women is supposed to uh, you know, bear half witness compared to men and should not be considered that well, when she commits a heinous crime, would her punishment be half? And they're like, no she will pay the same price as men. So my argument then is you can't have it at both ends. You can't treat the subject of women as half of men in one instance, right? And then when it comes to she being punished for her sins, consider her equal to a man. It is irreconcilable. That's you arguing from within a text itself, right? Whether you can convince people or not, these are just my examples. I don't mean to hurt anyone's feelings, but the most effective argument then always comes from within a text, right? So in this first part of his chapter, Eagleton is mostly explaining to us Derrida and deconstruction. And the aspects of it that he has covered is the instability of the text, the signs constantly vying for meaning, that there is no point of arrival, there is no transcendental signified. We never read the, reach the end of meaning. All we get is more signs, right? And that signs mean through difference. The sign is differential and not substantial, but meaning is also deferred to the next sign and the next sign. And that is Derrida's concept of difference, right? and that each sign carries the trace of the sign before it on this axis, but also other signs competing with it on the you know, uh, vertical plane, right? And so overall, by the end of this section, what we have learned is certain challenges to the structure of language itself and the binary structures, and then how Derrida works with the text but with the purpose of finding that one place in the text where the text cannot sustain its own logic and running it through the text to destabilize it. We have also learned that that act disrupting of binaries is not just an academic exercise, but most of the revolutionary politics, most of the change that happens in the world is by challenging those strict hierarchical binary structures, right? And that is the significance of deconstruction in the real sense of the word. So this is all I have today for part one of Eagleton's chapter four on post-structuralism. I hope it has clarified certain things for you. I will come back with more of the same chapter on post-structuralism in my next lecture. Until then, if you have any questions, please do post them um, in the comment section. And if you like what I do on this channel, please do subscribe. Um, I would love to have you as my regular friends on this channel. And that's all from me for now. Thank you so much. I will see you next time. And until then, stay safe, stay indoors, right? Take care of yourself and your family. and. Peace and love.